And what I want to ask us to do as a church is really just, can we just suspend any preconceived ideas of the book of Acts, of the Holy Spirit, and just really come to the scriptures with fresh eyes and just say, Jesus, I want to know who you are. Like, I want to know who the Holy Spirit is. I want to know what it actually looks like to walk the walk of Christianity. I want to see your vision for what the church actually is meant to be. Can we do that? Because I think Jesus is really going to speak to us through this, and we're going to see a lot of awesome stuff happen. And uh, why I love the book of Acts is because it's a picture of what a people looks like that is gripped by the Spirit of God. That's the picture of the book of Acts. It's a picture of what a church actually looks like when the Holy Spirit lands and he grips a people and he begins to move through them. I mean, we're gonna see some crazy stuff, right? Like there's crazy growth happening in the church. There's life change happening. People are getting their lives transformed, completely transformed by the power of God. There's community, beautiful communities happening. Uh, People are getting healed. Like there's diseases and sicknesses that are bowing to the name of Jesus in the book of Acts. People are getting delivered. There's dreams, there's visions. There's Jesus showing up, right? Like he's doing all sorts of stuff. Uh, There's people, there's crazy persecution, right? One part that we don't like about the book of Acts and the Holy Spirit showing up is a lot of times it leads to kind of persecution. So there's persecution happening. Peter gets in prison. God sends some angels, busts him out of prison. I mean, it's absolutely crazy, guys, what is going on in this book. The gospel is multiplying. The church is multiplying all over the place, exploding with influence and growth as it reaches entire cities, all right? That's the backdrop of the book of Acts. Now, and if I could just do some commentary on that for a second, that's why it's so frustrating when Christians show up into church world and we say stuff like this. You know, I'm just kind of looking for a small church vibe. Have you ever heard that before? Have you ever said that before, all right? I'm sure you have, right? I'm just kind of looking for a small church vibe where, you know, I know everybody's names and we know each other, we see each other every week and I know their dog's names and they know everything about my family. Like that's the kind of thing that we want. We're just looking for an environment that's comfortable, that's predictable, where we know everybody. And meanwhile, we don't really have any deep concern for our neighbors, for our coworkers, our family and friends that don't know Jesus and are on their way to hell. Like, it's crazy. What are we doing? But the book of Acts, what it's going to do is going to show up and completely destroy that version of Christianity. And Jesus is saying, listen, man, as a church, as my people, as my ecclesia, you are actually called to shape and change the world around you. That's crazy. Guys, that is the invitation of Jesus when he says, come and follow me, that he would send us out to actually change the world, not to just huddle up and make it all about us and just kind of exist in this self-existing, maintaining little circle where we're all beat up and discouraged all the time and we just come to lick each other's wounds and make each other feel better about why life sucks so bad. What does Jesus say? I will build my church and the gates of hell won't prevail against it. What's that mean? We're called on the offensive. This is the kind of church that Jesus is building and that he he's after. Now, I'm not knocking on Christian community. Obviously, we're all about that. We love that. But here's my point. When you approach church with that kind of consumeristic mindset, mission and community die because we're always looking for the right fit for me. Right? That's what happens. And so then the church gets full of self-centered people that don't really care about the world beyond these walls, and we just kind of shrivel up and die, right? And we come, we're discouraged, and we never fully engage because I've been hurt before. Come on, man. What is that? You want to talk about being hurt? How about we talk about the cross for a second? How about we talk about Jesus? And he pushed through that for you because he loves you so much. So that's what we're going to do. Uh, I'm soaked for it. <laughs> I hope you're excited. So Acts chapter one, let's just go ahead and jump right in. Uh, it says this in verse one. In the first book, O Theophilus. Okay, stop right there. Let's do some introduction to the book. A guy named Luke is writing the, the, the account of the book of Acts. He also, he references the first book and what he's talking about is the gospel of Luke. So Luke shows up and, and what I love about Luke is he's a Jesus guy, right? He's like, he's like I, if I could talk to you about one thing, it's gonna be Jesus. And so he spends so much of his time and energy and resources. He's a physician. He's a really smart dude. He writes the gospel of Luke and he's like, listen, man, I don't, I, like there's a lot of stuff that I could talk to you about. There's a lot 
lot of stuff that I could spend my time writing about. I could talk to you about how to have a better marriage, how to have, you know, seven principles to a highly effective life. I could talk to you about, you know, like how to win in the, the money game and do all this sort of stuff. But Luke is like, no, man, all of that, that doesn't even matter. I want to talk to you about Jesus. That's why I really like, love Luke. And so he writes the book of the gospel of Luke. And now we get to his second part of his writing, which has historically been called the Acts of the Apostles. And it focuses on how the Holy Spirit flipped the world upside down through Jesus's original uh, first century church. And which that, I think that idea alone really confronts modern Christianity in several ways. One of them being that Luke is about to prove over and over and over again, Christianity was never meant to be purely conceptual in your life. Like it was never meant to be just a nice idea or set of principles that you subscribe to, divorced from a life lived in the power of the spirit. Did you catch that? That's really important. Christianity was never meant to just be a nice idea that you kind of like look towards once a week, divorced from a life filled with the spirit and the power of God. And this is critical for us guys in this hour because we are living in the midst of a city, of a county, of a culture that is dead and that is in a state of decay. And we owe the world around us an encounter with Jesus. And so what happens is so many of us settle into this form of Jesus following that's so much less than what Jesus had in vision. And how many know that's a problem, right? When our definition of Christianity is different than the founder of Christianity's definition of what it's supposed to look like. That's kind of a big deal. And here's the, here's the thing. If I were to ask you, everybody in this room, what, what does it mean to be a Christian, Right? I mean, just kind of think about your answer for a second. We'd have a hundred different answers. We would be absolutely all over the place in this room. We'd have a bunch of different answers. And we talked about this last week, and really we talk about this often, how a large portion of the modern church world operates under this idea that being a Christian means I don't swear, <laughs> I show up to church every once in a while, every once in a while, and I try my best to live somewhat of a decent life, Okay? Meanwhile, Jesus over here in John chapter 14, verse 12, look at this. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me, do we have any believers in church this morning? Do we have any people that really believe in Jesus? This is what he says. Whoever believes in me also will do the works that I do and greater works than these will he do because I'm going to the Father. That's great. That's the founder of your faith, man. He's like, listen, man, I'm, I'm, I'm kicking this whole thing off and you are actually gonna carry on my ministry in the world. You're gonna do greater works. You're gonna do some awesome stuff. And this is the context of your life, man, as a believer in Jesus. And Jesus is saying, listen, you're gonna move in love and you're gonna live, you're gonna move in power. Like you are, because you're receiving my love for you and what I've done for you on the cross, that's gonna change your life. And you're gonna be sent out as my missionaries in your city and your family family in your neighborhood and you're going to live this crazy life of love of self-sacrifice of doing good for the sake of other people of laying your life down for others and you're also going to move in power right this is the works that Jesus is talking about here you're, they're, they're, the sick are going to be healed addictions are going to be broken off of people strongholds of mind are going to be broken and we are going to see the lost saved here's the point either Jesus is lying or we need to do some reevaluating of our lives and our walk, right? That's the point. And I don't think he's lying. I think he's really telling the truth. And so Luke says in verse one and the rest of verse one, in the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach. You got a Bible open, circle that word began. Do you have a Bible in church? Is this still cool? Can we still bring Bibles to church? Thank you. Please bring your Bible to church. It's so important, so awesome. So circle that word began right there. <clears throat> I love that. Luke is like, okay, so my first book, we talked about all that Jesus began to do and teach. Why is that so important? Man, you need hope this morning? Is anybody beat up, discouraged, a little bit discouraged right now? You're just kind of a dark place in life, in your marriage, personally, whatever. You're just kind of in a dark season. I know we're there as a nation right there. Maybe the weight of that's affecting you, right? You need some hope? There it is. All Jesus began to do and teach. What's that mean? 
Friend, here's the good news of Jesus for you this morning. Jesus is still working. He is still moving. He is still healing the sick. He is still restoring marriages. He's still, come on somebody, I need your help today. He is still restoring families. He is still changing destinies and seeking and saving lost people and filling them with his spirit and changing the world around us. Jesus is very much still alive and active. Listen, man, the tomb's empty. He didn't stay dead. Jesus is still alive and he's still moving. So there it is for you. There is still hope for you, man. There's still hope for you because Jesus is still alive and he is still working in our midst. Luke goes on in verse two and he says, until the day when he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit, which the Holy Spirit's gonna be a big theme in the book of Acts, to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. Now, that's really important too. And what I love about uh, Luke right here is he's a physician, right? He's a smart guy. And he's like, look, man, Theophilus, like this dude he's writing to, I want you to know Jesus actually shows up with many convincing proofs. Like Christianity, man, for those of you, maybe you're here, you're watching online and you, you would identify yourself as an atheist, as a skeptic of asking, spiritual questions. Dude, I am so pumped that you're here. Thank you so much for hanging out with us. And what you got to understand, and what Luke is saying here is like, listen, man, there are many convincing proofs that point in the direction of not only the existence of God, but the reality of Christianity. And that has some serious bearing on your life and how you interact and how you respond to the person and the work of Jesus. Luke says that there are many proofs, meaning you don't actually have to shut your brain off to become a Christian. Right, that's what he's trying to say. He's like, Theophilus, dude, you don't have to, and modern people, right? You don't have to shut off your brain to actually become a follower of Jesus. Christianity is not blind faith, right? He says, after Jesus was dead, he rose from the dead. That's what Luke says in verses two through four. He rose from the dead and he shows up with many convincing proofs, right? This is so much more, guys, <laughs> than just, you know, I looked up in a cloud and saw this, it looked like an angel. Therefore, God is real, right? Like that is not what Luke is saying here. Jesus can handle your doubts. He's not intimidated by them. In fact, did you know that Christianity was built on skeptics? You know the first people to question the resurrection were Jesus' original followers? Jesus can handle your doubts. They don't intimidate him, and he wins every time. I love it. And why this is important is because uh, there's this YouTuber, his name is Hemet Meta, and really this represents the, the worldview of a lot of people. He's, he's talking about why he's an atheist in one of his YouTube videos, and basically to start one, he just gets up and he makes this big, bold statement. He says, I am an atheist because there is no evidence for God. And then he just kind of doesn't say anything after that, and it's just kind of like, oh, yeah, Great, awesome soundbite statement. But the reality is, man, and maybe that's your, where you're at. Like, you, but here's the thing: that is, it's an empty statement that is actually, in fact, really lazy. And my question for the atheist is always: okay, so if you're going to claim that, what evidence can you give that proves that God doesn't exist? Because a lot of times we just leave it there and we don't actually give evidence to say, like, here's proof that God doesn't actually exist. Christopher Hitches, in fact, he says, what can be asserted without evidence can be dismissed without evidence. So you can't soundbite a statement like that without actually backing it up. The second point on this, though, is the absence of evidence doesn't necessarily mean that there's an evidence of absence. Even if there was no evidence for the existence of God, it doesn't necessarily follow, philosophically speaking, that God doesn't exist, right? Let me explain that this way, because, you know, we, we didn't know for thousands of years that the Big Bang happened, right? Right? And it wasn't until recently that we discovered that it actually happened. And at, lo and behold, it lines up with the biblical text. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. There was a definitive beginning moment to the history of the universe, right? And we didn't know about that for thousands of years in the science world, but it doesn't mean that it didn't actually happen. So because, just because there is a lack of evidence doesn't mean that there is evidence for the absence of the existence of God. Third point on this is the real issue is that there's plenty of evidence for the, plenty of evidence for the existence of God in what we can in fact call candidate evidence, meaning data and phenomena that professionals, man, okay, get this that professionals have argued work in favor towards the existence of God, all right? This is not your super cheesy, like, banana illustration that your pastor gave 20 years ago. 
right? You know, you got the banana, and you see the three little crooks, and then the two, and then it fits perfectly in the hand, right? Like, this is, this is like evidence that professionals, man, we're talking about physicists and scientists and historians and really smart, educated people with more degrees, you know, more letters before their first name than Fahrenheit, man. I mean, like, really smart people that are saying these things actually count towards the, in favor of the existence of God. Let me just show you a list right here uh, of different evidences that scholars have used. The existence of the universe, how about it? How about there's a, an article that you can look at right there. Like, why is there actually anything, right? Uh, William Lane Craig is famous for this argument. He says, everything that begins to exist has a cause, number one. The second is that the universe began to exist. The third, it means that there, therefore the universe has a cause. So how are you gonna tear that down? The fact that the universe actually exists points towards in favor that God is actually real. The fact mathematics, I mean, there's another uh, powerful point of data that points in favor of the existence of God. Beauty has been used as an argument for the existence of God. Miracles and consciousness, right? That has been used uh, as an argument towards the existence of God. Meaning what, man? Like there is a mountain of data that you actually have to work through if you are going to say, no, there's no evidence for God. So we've got that established. Then the question is, okay, is, is Christianity legit, right? Um, is there actual evidence that points in favor of Christianity? That Jesus, was he a real guy? Did he actually really die? And did he actually really bodily resurrect from the dead? And of course, the same exact thing is gonna happen. There's gonna be tons of information and data that's gonna back up that claim, as Luke is uh, claiming here in Acts chapter one. There's plenty of evidence for the, the resurrection of Jesus. Let me just give you one. Isolate the disciples for a second, okay? Jesus is crucified. He's martyred uh, for it, what he's claiming, right? And now his disciples, they're freaked out. They lock themselves up in an upper room. They're terrified, man. They all need to change the pants right now because they think the same thing that happened to Jesus is gonna happen to them, right? They are freaked out. And then all of a sudden, Acts chapter one happens and they completely turn in a 180 degree direction. And a lot of them, man, end up meeting these just like horrifically gruesome, brutal deaths. Like, if you ever thought about that? That's crazy. Like, you've got Peter. Dude, he was hung up on a cross upside down. This guy that denied that he knew Jesus three times, yeah, he shows up later in life. He ends up dying on a cross upside down because he didn't count himself worthy to, to die right side up on the cross like Jesus was. Thomas speared to death. John the apostle boiled in oil. He ended up living, though. I mean, I can't even imagine. That's crazy. But you've got all of these guys, Paul beheaded, like hundreds of first century Christians end up being brutally martyred for their faith. Why? Because they saw Jesus alive after he was dead. It's the only thing that makes sense. Why? Because how far are you willing to take a lie, man? You might take it pretty far, like especially with your spouse. You know, I might take a lie pretty far to win an argument, to be right. You know, I'm not judging you. But, you know, like, like when the gun is at your head, bro, and at your spouse's head, at your kid's head, and you say, recant or else you die, and first I'm gonna kill your family before you. At that point, it's what? Okay, whoa. <laughs> All right, tapping out, you got me. This whole thing is a hoax, but they didn't do that. Why? The tomb is empty. They actually saw Jesus raised from the dead. And in fact, Lee Strobel, who used to be a journalist for the Chicago Tribune, his wife ended up becoming a Jesus follower. And so he freaked out and he's trying to disprove Christianity. And he goes hard at this thing, man. <clears throat> and he's, he's approaching it with a bias, like this will be wrong. But he says this after, after all of his searching. In the end, after I had thoroughly investigated the matter, I reached an unexpected conclusion. It would actually take more faith to maintain my atheism than to become a follower of Jesus. Luke is saying many convincing proofs, but keeps getting better. He goes on after verse uh, three, and it says this. We're gonna read four through eight now. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said, it's not, time for, it's, not, it's not for you to know times or seasons that the Father is fixed by his own authority. Now here is the summary statement of the book of Acts, right here, okay? Verse eight, everything that's about to happen in the book of Acts is gonna come from, point back to this promise of Jesus and flow out from it. This is the summary statement of the whole book. But you will receive power 
when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witness in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Now, first thing I wanna point out to you, did you notice that the Holy Spirit's a promise? What does Jesus say? Wait for the promise of my Father, meaning that the Holy Spirit is a promised gift from Jesus for every born-again Christian. Do you get that? That's really important. He's like, literally, this is a promise. This is something that I want to do in your life. Uh, this is a, I guarantee you that this is gonna happen. You will receive the Holy Spirit. Now, if you fast forward to Acts chapter two, which we'll get to in a little bit, uh, we've got 120 people in the upper room, and they all are baptized in the Holy Spirit. They all begin to speak in new tongues. They are all filled with the spirit of Jesus, meaning what? Not one of them was left out, right? A lot of times I think, you know, we can think like, oh, I'm not spiritual enough for that. Like, you know, whatever that guy is, he can have. Literally, the Holy Spirit shows up for every single person in the upper room. Like, that is awesome, man. Meaning it wasn't just, this wasn't something for just the 12 apostles, dude. It was literally 120 people. And all throughout the book of Acts, we got Gentiles being baptized in the Holy Spirit, non-Jewish people. We've got just uh, people all over the place, man. It's totally just pagan, ridiculous areas and cities being baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit. This is a promise in your life. And that's important because the Holy Spirit is a part of the gospel package. And what I mean by that is a lot of people have this gospel that excludes God as Father. Father. Like we can relate to Jesus, sure, we get that, but we kind of leave the Father out, we leave the Holy Spirit out. A lot of people have a gospel with the Holy Spirit, but no Jesus, and, and that's when we get really weird, right? A lot of people, what I'm saying is it's like you go to McDonald's and you order a Big Mac, number one, and they leave the fries out. It's like substantially worse, okay? That's the point. And a lot of us do that with our Christian faith, is we have a gospel that doesn't actually include the Holy Spirit, man. And the point is, is the good news of Jesus is the Father and the Son and the Spirit conspiring together to save you and to fill you and to transform your life, bro. Amen. It's the whole Godhead working together in your favor, dude. That should freak you out, all right? Because that's freaking me out right now. Whoa, that feels good. <clears throat> this is the gospel. And in fact, the Holy Spirit isn't just promised to every Christian, but he's also not optional. I don't know if you know that, but there is no victorious Christian living there's no transformation without the Holy Spirit in operation in your life. And why I love verse eight is for many reasons. One of them is Jesus, he's giving you a roadmap for your life right here. I don't know if you recognize that, but this is literally, Acts one verse eight is a roadmap for your life. And what I mean by that is, you know, in leadership circles, we talk about, you know, what's the white hot why? Have you ever heard that before? Like what's the why, why does this organization exist? Why do I exist? Why does our church exist? What is the white, hot, flaming, consuming why that's gonna drive you every single day, that's gonna get you up out of bed in the morning, that's gonna keep you focused when the entire world comes crashing down? What is your white, hot why? And I wanna ask you in the same way, the same question today. Like, what's your white, hot why? Man, why do you exist? Bro, why are you sucking air on planet Earth right now? Why are you a thing? Why are you in this room? Like what, and, and you know, we might have an answer in our head that we come up with, like because we're, we're you know, a lot of us in this room, we're, we're Christians, we're following Jesus, and it's like, I exist for the glory of God, right? And you don't even know what that means, dude, right? Like what do your actions tell you that you're really living for? Jesus, what he's doing right here, man, he's giving you a roadmap for your life, and he's like, this is why you're alive, bro. Like, I keep saying that, I'm sorry, that's really annoying. You guys ever get that when preachers just say the same thing over again, and it's just like nails on a chalkboard? We'll try to leave bro out for the rest of the service, okay? But Jesus is like, dude. <laughs> This is why you're alive, to be clothed with power from on high and to be a witness. This is why you are alive. And we have to have an answer to that question, man, because what's gonna happen if you don't answer that and if you don't agree with Jesus' answer for you in that, what's gonna happen is you're gonna, you're gonna blink and your life is gonna be over and you have floated through and wasted it. And you're gonna wake up one day and it's gonna be too late. 
so often what happens is, is this, this seductive message of you know, American comfort, what it does is it comes and it entices us to live a life detached from any real meaning, purpose, or significance. And we just kind of go to sleep, right? We just kind of grind it out, get paid, live as comfortably as possible. It's all about more vacation time. Give me the bigger house, the nicer house, the nicer car, the nicer toys. I got to keep up with my buddy and all he's doing and, you know, whatever. Got to keep up with that. Uh, just raise your kids better than she does, right? We play this, like, comparison game where we're just trying to inch ahead of everybody and we just kind of go to sleep, right? For some of us, the why behind our life right now is just, like, I want to redo my kitchen and buy a boat or whatever it is. It's like, what is that, man? What is that? That is the most dis- depressing thing that I've ever heard in my entire life. That's what you're building your life towards? To remodel your kitchen and buy a boat. <laughs> Meanwhile, Jesus is over here. He's like, listen, this is my will for your life, to be clothed with power, to receive power, to be transformed, and to be my witness. That's a much better offer if you didn't, if the wires didn't connect for you. Much better offer. He's saying, I want you to experience the movement and the power of God in your life, man, in your marriage, in your family, in your neighborhood, at your workplace. And I want you to be so wrecked by it that you just can't help but tell everybody about it. That's what Jesus is saying. And here's the thing that's beautiful about this. <clears throat> Who, who's the power in this equation? It's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's the power, meaning what? You are not the power. And that's really offensive in our current culture, cultural moment, right? Because New Age philosophy preaching at you all the time would say, oh, the power's within you. Go within. Find the power within. <laughs> Jazz hands. <laughs> right? Like, like. Which is total bogus, man. Like, Jesus is like, listen, my power, it it makes, like, anything that you could muster up, nothing. Garbage. Trash. Compared to what happens when my spirit comes and rests on somebody. Jesus is saying, you're not the power, man. And why this is so important, man, is because what we do is is, is we we try and white-knuckle stuff. We try and white knuckle it. We try and say, you know, I just gotta try harder. I gotta do more. I gotta beat this thin thing. I gotta try as hard as I can to be as good as I can for God. And it's destined to fail and it never works. Jesus is saying, my spirit is the source of power. And we get really weird with this, right? So when our kids go crazy and they walk away from Jesus, you know, and we start thinking stuff like, well, I gotta do this and this and this and this and this, and here's my list of 10 good Christian things to do to win them back, and I gotta give them this book at this time, and then I'm gonna send them this podcast, and I'm gonna send them this. Dude, what are you saying? I'm the power that's gonna save them. No, it's Holy Spirit, get them. Holy Spirit, you're the one that can transform their heart, and he will. That's the point. <laughs> or, you know, like, I don't know what to say to my neighbor. I don't know how to invite him to church. I don't know how to talk to my, this person I work with every single day about Jesus. So I gotta do this and this and this. We come up with all these crazy formulas. And Jesus is like, shut up. You're not the power. It's the Holy Spirit that empowers you to be the witness. That is so freeing. Don't you just feel like religion just falling off of you right there? That's what Jesus is saying. <clears throat> my spirit in you and through you is what's gonna make the difference and change the world around you. Now, let me even flip this in a different direction because Jesus says the Holy Spirit empowers you to be a witness, but a witness to what? To the gospel, yes, that Jesus lived the perfect life that you never could. He died the death that you deserved on the cross, taking the penalty for your sin, raised to life three days later, so by you, by you having faith in him, you could receive newness of life. All of that, yes, you're gonna be a witness to the gospel, but not just as static words, not just as like, this is what I, you know, these, here's, here's the three different steps of the gospel. And then you just kind of regurgitate that as information alone that's de- detached from a life of personal transformation. Like, what are you witnessing to? Dude, what Jesus has done in my life. That's what you're witnessing to. This is how the gospel has transformed me. This is the gospel, how it's shaped me, how it's changed me, how Jesus has changed my life. Meaning that, and here's some more good news for you, that there's power in the Holy Spirit right now, friend, to change your life right now, okay? I I mean, can we just get outside of the cynicism of life sucks and everything's bad and it's just gonna continue to be bad and woe is me and everything's bad (laughs) for a second? And can I just tell you, there's hope for you 
The gospel is the power of God. Jesus doesn't want you to just regurgitate information, but to actually experience what transformation is like in your life firsthand. Meaning there's power to change your life right now. There's power to change your marriage right now. There is power in the Holy Spirit to break you out of that pornography addiction right now. Or whatever the addiction, whatever the self-medication is for you, there is power in Jesus to break chains of brokenness, of shame, of guilt, of condemnation, of sin in your life right now. Amen. You know, I love, one thing I love about the cross, you know, we've got, we've got the cross up here, right? You just look at it for a second. That, it's not just a nice decoration, right? Every single week that you guys show up here, that's preaching something at you. And you know what it's preaching? You can't do it. That's what the cross, the cross is preaching at you and I every single weekend. You can't do it. Somebody had to do it for you. Somebody has to do it for you. And his name is Jesus, and he wants to. <clears throat> and here's the thing. Well, you wanna know what's so crazy about that? Is he wants to, like, he actually wants to change your life. He wants to empower you. Paul, at the end of the book of Philippians, he talks about how he's yearning for the Philippians with the affection of Christ. I've just been thinking about that verse the last couple of weeks. I mean, that's so crazy. Literally, he, he says, I'm yearning for you with the affection of Jesus. Meaning what? That Jesus has affection in his heart for his people. He, like in the heart of Jesus right now is a yearning for you. Did you know that? Like he yearns for you, he longs for you, he has affection over your life. Like he's not just tolerating you, he actually really likes you, okay? That's what Paul's telling us at the end of Philippians. And that's really important. And so in, in, the, in the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 10, Jesus takes it to a whole nother level and he's like, listen, even the hairs on your head are numbered. Like God has actually numbered the hairs on your head. And for those of us that have kids, think about that. Like actually going home today and just like, you know, okay, one, two, three. That's crazy. You never do that. I've never even thought about doing that. Neither of you. Why? Because you don't care, okay? Let's, right? I don't care. Like, I don't care about how many hairs are on Asher's head. I don't care how many are on Lena's head. She's got a lot less, right? But hopefully it grows in someday. Uh, but I don't care, and you don't care because you're a horrible parent. The point is, I'm just kidding. God cares so much about your life that he even cares about the amount of hair that's on your head right now. And for those of you that are balding, I don't know what that means in the context of your life, but <laughs> he cares so much about you that he even knows the amount of hair that are on your head. And what happens, man, when you live into that experience, when you live into that reality, this is what it looks like, you receiving power from on high in the context of your life, that spills out everywhere. And in fact, Martin Lloyd-Jones, he says, He's talking about this is the, the, the power of the Spirit coming on the Christian. And he says, he says this about living in that reality. The fuses of love are so overloaded, they almost blow out. Has that ever been your experience as a Jesus follower? Okay, just think about that for a second. The fuses of love are so overloaded, they almost blow out. The subconscious doubts that, that God wasn't thinking about me at the time, but that pop up every now and then, they're all completely gone. And in their place is utter and indestructible assurance, man. You can't do anything about it. It's indestructible. You can't break it. So that you know that you know that you know that God is real and that Jesus lives and that you are loved and that to be saved is the greatest thing in the world. And as you walk on down the street, you can scarcely contain yourself and you wanna cry out, my father loves me. My father loves me. Oh, what a great father I have. What a father, what a father. Oh. Paul in Romans chapter five, verse five, he says that God has poured out his love in our hearts through his spirit. And that changes everything. So now there's a plan for how all of this works, right? Jesus, he, he says in verse eight, you're gonna receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses. And he gives a pattern, Jerusalem and then Judea and then Samaria into the end of the earth. Now, 
<clears throat> that's really important. Jerusalem, what was significant about that is that was the city that they were in. Okay, Judea was the surrounding region, Samaria was to the north, and then the end of the earth was beyond that. Meaning what? Jesus didn't call these guys to Nepal first, right? He didn't call them to the other end of the earth. He said, listen, man, if you can't figure out how to reach your neighbors for Jesus, you are no use to me in Bangladesh, right, or in Africa, or you, like, li literally, I have put you here for a reason, and we're gonna focus first on Jerusalem, and this is the text that actually God used to call me out of YWAM, believe it or not, for those of you that don't know my story, I was in YWAM, and let me preface this by saying I love YWAM, I absolutely love the ministry, we've got a local base up in Linden, I know the leadership there, love them so much, love what God is using them to do, I think all of our young people after they graduate high school should go do a DTS, uh, but I want you to come back. That's the thing. I want you to come back here because we need your passion. We need your fire here. And so what happened to me in my story is I got saved when I was 19. I was absolutely on fire for God. Just like I literally went from drug deals and back alleys in Bellingham to reading my Bible for eight hours a day at Woods Coffee in Linden, like, all the time. It's crazy, right? Total day, night and day transformation. And so I'm sold out. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to go, I'm going to go do YWAM. I'm going to go preach the gospel to the nations and I'm going to be a martyr by the time I'm 30, right? Like that was kind of, that was my life goal. I was sold out, man. Like this is going to happen. I'm going to go to Iran, Iraq, the hardest and darkest places, and I don't even care. And I'm going to get killed by the time I'm 30 and it's going to be great. That was my plan for my life. But what happened, and, and, and okay, so actually I went to Kona, Hawaii, Big Island, and um, it was awesome because I was telling people, they were like, what are you doing with your life now? You're 19, what's your plan? I was like, well, I'm going to go on a missions trip. And they were like, oh, cool, where? Uh, Hawaii? <laughs> okay, you're going on a missions trip to Hawaii. Yeah, all right. Have fun, right? Like that was kind of the reaction that I got from people. But I got there, man, it was crazy. I began to see this verse in operation through my life for the first time. So buddies and I, what we would do is we would just go downtown, uh, big uh, Kona, whatever, by the pier. Uh, for those of you five people that know what <laughs> the area I'm talking about. Anyways, uh, too much information. So we're there and we just start talking to people about Jesus. Like, Holy Spirit, you said that we're, we're gonna have power to witness to people. So here we are, we make ourselves. I literally saw the power of God move for the first time in my life. Life, man. It was crazy. There was this one guy who was just walking by the street and he was paralyzed on the right side of his body. He was walking with this really bad limp. He couldn't lift his arm above here. He had a horse step on him, break his back in a certain area and it paralyzed the right side of his body, messed him up really bad. And so we were like, hey man, you know what? Jesus says in Mark 16, we're gonna lay our hands on sick people and they're gonna recover. So let's pray for you. We pray for the guy. We speak the name of Jesus over his body. We pray once. He lifts his arm up to right here. He hadn't been able to do that in years. He looks at us. He looks at his arm. Arm. He looks at us, he looks at his arm, and he starts freaking out. And we start freaking out because it's like Jesus did it. And so he puts his arm down, and we pray again. And sure enough, he could lift his arm all the way above his head. He hadn't been able to do that in years, man. Jesus totally restores the guy, totally heals the guy, and he's weeping right there on the spot as we lead him to Jesus. Crazy. Jesus is still active, he is still moving, he is still doing awesome stuff. But in the midst of all of that, what God began to do in my life is he, he spoke to me actually this verse right here and he was like, Taylor, I didn't call you to Hawaii. I didn't call you to all of these other areas. Bellingham is where I put you, right? The reason why you were born here. Don't you think God in his sovereignty, if he wanted you to do something else, he could have put you there, right? Not that we're never gonna go to the nations, we're gonna do that. But this is our Jerusalem. This is our backyard. What's your Jerusalem, man? What, what, are you, what is God calling you to that you're just kind of neglecting because it's right in front of your face? That's the point. Jesus says, I'm calling you first to Jerusalem. And here's the deal, guys. <clears throat> Whatcom County needs a move of the Spirit. Okay, we're not playing church here. This, we, I refuse, as long as God gives me grace to be in the position that I'm in, I refuse to let this church wall up and forget about the nine out of 10 people that are going to hell outside of the walls of this building. <laughs> Just not gonna do it. We're not gonna be that church that forget about the fact that we have neighbors that don't know Jesus, coworkers, family members, friends, thousands of people driving by our church right now that don't know Jesus. Back in verse two in Acts one, Luke says that Jesus had chosen 12 apostles. 
And in the same way, man, what I wanna say to you is that God has chosen you sovereignly to be alive in this moment right now. He puts you in this generation. He puts you in this room for a meaning and for a purpose. And in fact, Paul says in Acts chapter 17, verses 26 through 27, and he made from one man, God made from one man, every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods and the boundaries of their dwelling place that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. Yet he is actually not far from each one of us. What's God saying? God puts you here. He puts you in Bellingham for a reason. He puts you at your job for a reason. He gave you your kids for a reason. He puts you in your neighborhood for a reason. And it's in order that some would be able to feel their way to God through your life. That's the point. I mean, I mean, think about the passions that God gave you. That was him sovereignly wiring your heart in a certain direction to reach a certain type of person. Your hobbies, your desires. Dude, be the best in your field. And recognize that Jesus puts you there for a reason and for a purpose. I wanna close with this thought. Um, here's the point. If not you, nobody's gonna show up. If not us, then who, guys? I mean, you know, let's just level with each other for a second. If not now, then when? There is work to be done in our city. There's work to be done in your family, at your job, in your office, in your field, in your neighborhood. You know, I hate my neighbor. They suck. The dog always comes and craps on my yard. What I'm telling you is it's the sovereignty of God that put that dog in your yard, okay? So... Learn to love the dog, all right? There is work to be done. And here's the deal. Jesus is looking for our yes. That's all he wants. He's looking for, it, literally, we can't do anything. That's the point Luke is saying. Jesus is saying, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. <clears throat> so let's give it to him. Would you stand with me? Before we do that, I've just had this pretty strong in my heart the last uh, couple minutes here. I don't wanna just preach about the power and not model the power. One thing that we were getting uh, in our pre-service prayer meeting is, uh, and I'm believing that we're gonna see the Holy Spirit do this um, more frequently here this year, is, uh, I, I, so this last week was a crazy week in our county. We actually had in one 24-hour period, six people commit suicide, and all of our support officers were dispatched at the same time, and it was just absolutely crazy. And uh, I, I, we're just sensing that there's some people in this room watching online where you've just been exceptionally discouraged this week. Depressed, you might've even had some suicidal thoughts, but I wanna tell you today is that's actually a demonic spirit and operation in your life. And the Holy Spirit literally wants to break that off of you right now. So if you would be so bold to raise your hand real quick so I can know who I'm praying for, I would invite you to do that if this is for you. We got several people. And what I wanna say to you is Jesus loves you. He loves you so much. Satan comes to steal and to kill and destroy. That's the voice of the accuser. Jesus comes to give life and give it abundantly. And he's saying, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Let's pray. Jesus, I just pray for these three and whoever else online and in the room that didn't raise their hand, I come against that spirit of suicide right now and I break it off of their lives in Jesus' name. And I loose the Holy Spirit of God to bring joy and freedom and the love of God, the affection of Jesus. Lord, I thank you that you would just lay them out in your, in your love for them, oh God, right now in Jesus' name. We thank you that they go free Lord, we recognize the voice of the accuser and we cast it out, we replace it with truth that they are loved, they are blood-bought by Jesus and we thank you for freedom in their lives right now in Jesus' name. And God, we just here, we just stand before you and we just say you have our yes, Jesus. You have our yes. It's, it's weak, it's little, but you have our yes. And God, I pray that you would use us as a church body, use us as your, as your people to absolutely shift the spiritual landscape in Whatcom County. Lord, we say yes to your mission, to your purpose. Holy Spirit, empower us now for the work of ministry in Jesus' name. And everybody said... Amen, amen. Can we give Jesus a shout, guys? 
hey, if we can pray for you for anything, if you raise your hand, we would love to pray for you and encourage you any way we can. If you haven't given your life to Jesus, please come forward. He loves you. Stop wasting your life another day without him. Otherwise, be kind to those that God has placed around you, and we'll see you next Sunday. We've got a prayer team off to my left. Feel free to come. Have a great week, everybody.